thank you very much for the opportunity and for allowing us to speak to you today. So just to show you on that picture, we have TUDEF Library, which is actually quite a nice building. So that's where all the students come. They sit on the grass and we try to welcome them and seduce them. You know, that's a nice place to come. So please come to the library. But without any further introduction, so thank you, Vanessa, you already talked about my first first slide, but it will be a trio today, so I will talk a little bit, and then the two actual data stewards who are doing the day-to-day -day work will tell you about their experiences with our data management perspective. And I thought that before I start, I could tell you what TUDELF is, because I bet, like, has anybody here, if you heard about TUDELF, can you raise your hand? Wow, I'm very impressed. <laughs> so TUDELF stands for the Delft University of Technology. So basically it means that we just focus on sciences. So social sciences is part of sciences in the Netherlands, so just to let you know, but we don't have many arts and humanities within TU Delft. And I also wanted to tell you where Delft is because maybe people don't know that as well. I didn't know, I have to say. Uh, Delft is just there. It's the sort of in between The Hague and Rotterdam. And I think quite interestingly, and it also reflects how collaborative in nature Dutch people are, that's before they managed to take away the lamp from the sea. So if that did not happen, Delft would be just <laughs> down there <laughs> below the sea level. So this sort of reflects that Dutch are quite collaborative people in spirit, and I guess my colleagues can t tell you a little bit more about this. But the plan for today, so first I would like to give you a little bit of a bigger picture and understanding what the Dutch landscape about open science and research data in general, it's quite different from we have in the UK and how TU Delft wants to respond to this. And then we'll be telling you a little bit about what the data stewards actually are, what do they do for the whole day. And uh, finally, we'll give you one case study from one of the eight faculties that we have in TU Delft and what does it mean to have a data steward there. And finally, there will be some time for questions. And the slides are, of course, available. So if you would like to see the presentation, you can go to Zenodo and you can download all the slides. So just to start, the Dutch perspective. What is the Dutch perspective on open science and data management? And I'm very grateful to Nicole because she already introduced the funders management and then you talk about the policies and so on. So yes, in the Netherlands, we also have funding bodies. We also have policies. So as you all know, yes, there are the requirements. This one comes from Horizon 2020, so the European Commission. We have some other funders, for example, NWO, which encourage research. Actually, they require that data is shared, that researchers submit data management plans. So same old, same old. But there are some special things, and I guess this also comes from the European Commission, but many of those people that work on this are actually from the Netherlands, so they are actively promoting these ideas within the Netherlands. You might have heard about the fact that now the European Commission's recommendation is that 5% of the research expenditure, which you're putting on your grant proposals, should be devoted to managing research data. Moreover, and this guy is actually one of our you know, key, let's say, advocates for data management within Netherlands, Barent Mons. He is one of the expert consultants for the European Commission. He is actually advocating that in the next couple of years, we'll need 500,000 data stewards within Europe. So really emphasizing how much need there is for research data within researchers who are doing a lot of data intensive research. And furthermore, because people were talking earlier about the need for rewarding researchers doing the right things. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this document. There was a report in July from the European Commission about rewarding researchers who are committed to open science practices. So the suggestion was that perhaps in the next big funding scheme from the European Commission, we now have Horizon 2020, the future one will be FP9. Should we perhaps indeed require that researchers who will be eligible for grant applications should demonstrate commitment to open science? So that's the broader perspective that drives development of open science and data management agenda in the Netherlands. Of course, that wants to be competitive. So we want to make sure that our researchers are eligible to apply to this funding scheme so they can demonstrate the commitment to open science. Specifically in the Netherlands, we have this guy, he's our prime minister, and don't try to play this video unless you speak Dutch because it's in Dutch, so you will not understand. But what I wanted to point out that the strategy of the government for the future really encompasses open science and open access. This should be the norm. So that's really coming from the funding bodies to the government and to universities themselves. And like a huge Dutch coalition, again, collaborative project, which is called the 
open science national plan for like making sure that data and open access becoming the norm. So there was a coalition of all the different universities and various stakeholders which came up with their own self-driven initiative. What do we as Netherlands want to achieve? And what do they want to do? They want to make sure that by 2020, all research data is fair, that researchers are being recognized and rewarded for open science practices, but also that we have the full access to publications and that researchers give, get the, equip the support that they need to do these practices on their day-to-day -day basis. And what about TU Delft? How TU Delft treats all these? So TU Delft realized, you know, as a university in the Netherlands, we actually have to be collaborative to keep up, to be competitive. So we need to work together, we need to exchange the ideas, we need to be open, to be visible and to be still relevant to the world. So here's our actually ex-rector who really took the idea of open science forward. And what he did, he actually embraced the idea of, of the openness, calling TU Delft as the year of the open. So 2017 was the year of the open of TU Delft. And our research data management program, the data stewardship program, is actually a necessary prerequisite to this. In a way, you can't really think about opening up your research data if your research data has not been managed properly. What do you open up if you don't know what your, where your files are, what are they, what led to your publication? So the data stewardship program at TU Delft is actually the core component of the wider open science agenda at TU Delft. And what's the goal of this data stewardship program? The goal of the program is to really make sure that researchers across the whole campus are able to implement good data management practices for their day-to-day -day life as researchers. And of course, this would mean different things to different people and different disciplines. And at this stage, I would give way to Case. So thank you, uh, Marta. Uh, go to the next slide. So as a data steward, I, uh, I am the data steward in the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences. And uh, I also have a background from this faculty. I actually did my research uh, on the safety of coastal dunes against flooding. So Marta's picture <laughs> of the uh, large part of the country being below sea level is very relevant. And uh, I moved gradually uh, more and more into data management because also for keeping the country safe against flooding, uh, a lot of data is involved. And basically my view is that uh, in improving data management uh, in research should be a combination of uh, top-down uh, and engagement of researchers. So you need, uh, you, you need top-down involvement and acknowledgement of the value and the need for proper data management. But for the implementation, you actually need the re researcher uh, on the working floor to, uh, to carry out the work and to also uh, show what is really needed and what, what does work for them. So. That is the, the combination of, uh, as a data steward, to stay connected to the researcher and see how they are uh, doing their research, what do they need, and at the same time, uh, processing that into uh, services and needs in terms of, uh, well, different, from different sides, but anyway, coming to a more uh, strategic approach. And there, we always say, well, the researcher and the research should be uh, central. So we can assist as data stewards and show what's possible, uh, but still, uh, well, the workflow and the practice of the researcher stays central. So in the different phases, coming from new ideas to funding to uh, experiments uh, and publishing, uh, we can, in the different uh, parts, we can assist. But the researchers should do the work themselves. And for uh, staying connected, so we go into conversation 
uh, we see what uh, how they are working and also from my uh, perspective it works to tell them that I have a background in research that I know what they are talking about I can show uh, what the value is of proper data management and that helps very much to to uh, stay connected and to uh, well to also show what is possible and what the benefits are and then that can be processed towards more strategic um, services and, and uh, systems on different levels. So uh, depending on, uh, on disciplines, sometimes you need different approaches and there are different habits, different software used. And uh, so you need a kind of adapters and plugs to have on top of a certain base layer of a data management system where different researchers from different uh, backgrounds can talk to, but under the hood there is a certain common base. And that's what I try to, to achieve and to, uh, to show what's possible there. I think time is a bit, uh, so I give the floor to, uh, to Jasper to talk about the uh, electro engineering. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Jasper Nijkers. Martin introduced me. I'm the data steward for the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Math and Computer Science. That's another piece of not so beautiful Delft architecture in comparison to the library, but still it's our building. Um, I'm going to talk about the case study for this faculty specific, what we've found so far. Um, and a, little, a couple of results of an art, do you have two minutes, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be very quick. Uh, what we've found out so far, um, some things we are working on and how we are working. So let's see, this is for, yeah. So what we found out that applied mathematics is by far the most common research methodology as is in the name of mathematics. But this also goes for um, uh, like mathematical physics, which is the Department of Applied Math, uh, intelligence, uh, electrical power systems, which is electrical engineering, and um, intelligence systems department has web information systems. Now this means that the primary data that researchers use often comes from third parties and commercial third parties. They, are, uh, they write code that uh, contains algorithms to process that data. That means that the primary research data usually is not ours or not gathered by the re uh, by researchers themselves. Now, that also means we have several big research, uh, big data researchers. Now, uh, what we have found, so that leads to the following topics that we've identified so far, and I'm going through this very quickly, um, that, that are important. So because a lot of the researchers write their own code, the software sustainability is very important. If you want to make research reproducible, and presenters uh, before me have said it, reproducibility is key. You need to make sure that their code is kept as part of the data, but also maintained, because depending on what kind of platform you write, on, uh, you write your code on, or with um, the updates from the software itself, it might not even be usable. Another part is, like I told you, uh, the intellectual property rights, and um, with regard to that, we had a small survey, and just you see percentages, but there are about 100 responses. Uh, only less than 50% know, knows who owns the research data they are working with, and I'd say that's not enough. And archiving, archiving of large data sets, um, what are the current options, because we currently have none, so that's something we need to think about for the future. So when you talk about how we go about working and engaging researchers, uh, creating awareness, it, it, it comes to with a little bit of humor because while this is a very serious topic, if you can need to engage researchers who by definition are skeptical, you need to do that a little bit lightheartedness. This is actually a slide we use, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, with regard to, to, to this specific topic to prevent data loss, it's usually PhD students um, that lose their data when they go away, when they finish their PhD. Um, they're abroad, and when their um, um, their promoter tries to contact them, the data is gone. Their laptop got wiped, or it is. I have to stop. Okay, so, <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah, no, 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 no. For, uh, I have to stop. But first, this. Okay, so what are we currently working on then? Um, uh, specifically, uh, a, a, a project where there's sensitive data that, that that we need to have ownership for because. 
it's, we work in two university medical centers, and it's not clear who owns the data, but it's very privacy-sensitive data. So this is more of a, of a case where, okay, we need to figure out how we can handle this data. And then uh, the mandatory DMP, as Marta told about, there are funders who require you to uh, write a DMP and possibly archive your data. Now, that, that program is important because it contains five big data projects. And that's going, those are going to be, I think, the first big data projects where the funders are going to require you, if possible, to archive your data. But again, what are the options? And we need to figure that out in the upcoming years. And then a PhD student policy where we want to make sure that uh, if, if we want to ensure that PhD students uh, uh, make it mandatory for them to archive their data, how much work will that create for us? Because if we have eight, 80 new PhD students a year, welcome to one data steward, that's not enough resources we have. Okay, so like Marta told, uh, told, you, uh, told everybody here, we currently have three faculties who have data stewards out of eight, but we're working on uh, getting all faculties data stewards. So for those who are interested, come join us. We are currently hiring. <laughs> Thank you, that was it. <laughs> then I give this to you. Okay, how far am I going? Quite far. Okay. Oh, gosh. You know what? I'm just going to drop <laughs> and do a light toss. Yeah, a uh, very quick question again. Um, you said that um, as a researcher that it was easier for you to speak to researchers about managing the data. Do you think that's uh, an important point? Do you think they'll have more respect for uh, your opinion coming at it as someone with research experience as opposed to someone who maybe has never done any research coming and saying, well, you need to put your data here and um, without actually having had to do it themselves? Yeah, well, I think uh, as a researcher, so you uh, more easily can uh, speak the language, let's say, and, and uh, get this connection. So show your, your own experience. And uh, in, well, in my experience, that really helps to show that you know what you're talking about and that you also know that the research is the basic and that the so proper uh, handling all the things around, including data, uh, that should serve this research and it should not be a means in itself. Mm. Perhaps if I may just add to this and something that I also wanted to stress that when we hire our data stewards at each of the faculties, the key requirement is actually not to have data management experience, but to be the, the disciplinary expert for one of the research area of the faculty. So we are expecting people to at least have a PhD degree or equivalent experience and understanding of the research being done at the faculty. Right. So that's the key requirement, and we thought we can teach people data management principles, funded requirements, whatever that is, in three months. So I think guys are currently doing intense training on data management, you know, all these policies and so on, but this is something people can learn. Right. But is this through the library or through the academic departments? So the appointment is actually based within faculties. The library is coordinating the whole data stewardship project, making sure that data stewards don't run in all the directions, you know, as individuals and researchers and so on, but actually there is some bigger picture around this. But the data stewards are actually appointed within faculties. So they sit there and your line managers are within faculties as well. So you are really deeply embedded within faculties. Okay. One more question. We're running a bit late. We Um, I know that a lot of universities, including ours, are looking at research software engineers. And I know that, Jasper, you mentioned software code in particular. Is that a role that you are looking into? Is that complementary, or is that kind of the same thing? Well, we are not, um, like, like Case told, uh, our role is to advise on what to do. And usually when we mention that, OK, if you write code, code is part of your data. If you want to make your research reproducible, you need to manage your code in such a way that it can be used by a third party. And the immediate response is GitHub. But it's on GitHub. Is that not good enough? Yep, well, usually it is. But then we advise, or we are currently looking into options that are less commercial because GitHub is commercial. I don't know if that answers your question, by the way, in total. Or I don't know. Is Delft looking at specifically supporting software as its own thing, or is it does it come under your 
Yeah, um, as, as far as I know, we're currently looking into having a uh, organization-specific uh, uh, GitLab. And so maybe I can also add to this that we're actually thinking of having software stewards. That's something like, oh in okay. you know, in like thinking process, but maybe that would be useful to right. have somebody for organization. Yeah. And I know that there are some discussions because currently, as probably many of you, we actually don't have a data policy, by the way. We first want to create the support and the people on the ground making sure we have the solutions before we have the policy in place. We, we are currently drafting the data management policy, but we are thinking of actually having a separate software management policy. So that's a bit unfair yeah. to say that software is data. No, it's not. The archiving of software is a completely different story than treating data, so. Yeah, no, one of the things if we were talking about PhD students is we think about general training and then there's an absolute necessity for specific software um, training with regard to data management. Because it's, it's such a, a, yeah, a specific topic that you can't just do that together with regular data management. Yeah, I, I even would say that uh, also f uh, in, in data management, we can learn a lot from, uh, from software management. I'm very much in favor of treating data in, in, uh, in, uh, and release cycles similar to uh, as it's uh, commonly used in software. So in the question, 